We are going to read from Luke chapter 12. It will be projected on the screen, but you might want to look it up in the Bibles provided or the one you brought along. Luke chapter 12, the first 12 verses. This is Jesus as he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's traveling with his 12 disciples. And it says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the house rooftops. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are no numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are reading your word and we're thinking about it and we're going to have a sermon on it. We pray that you help us to hear your voice and through the word and through the preaching. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you move in us and move among us, that you affirm in us what needs to be affirmed and that you challenge in us what doesn't quite live up to your calling. And we pray that through this preaching and through our reflection that we can be strengthened in our faith and in our hope, and in our love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dearly loved people of God, a lot of us together in this congregation are reading through the gospel according to Luke together. It gets, uh, you can pick up copies of the daily readings at the door. It gets emailed to others of you. If you're interested in that, let me know. But the goal of those readings is to work our way through the Gospel of Luke from Jesus' birth that we celebrated and marked at Christmas time all the way up to his uh, crucifixion on Good Friday and then to read about his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Because ever since Christmas, our eyes have been fixed forward looking ahead to Jesus' death and to his resurrection. This week, though, that countdown to Good Friday and Easter gets put into a little bit more focus. Because this week, starting on Ash Wednesday, is the beginning of Lent. Lent is a time when a lot of people start becoming a little bit more intentional about working on, renewing, strengthening their walk of faith. They spend a little more time meditating on the cost that it took to redeem them from sin and from death. Lent is often a time of prayer. It can be a time of fasting. 
and can be a time of recommitment to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And throughout the Sundays in Lent, we're going to be doing a series of sermons looking at Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and the people that he ate with and the conversations that he had when he broke bread with people. There's a phrase that describes eating in that time and in that place. You know how we sometimes say, well, um, yeah, I don't know what we say. You are what you eat, right? We sometimes say that you are what you eat. In the Bible times, in the places where Jesus lived, it was a little bit different. The saying was, you are with whom you eat. That your identity is shaped by the, the people that you eat together with. That your identity is shaped or defined by the people that you enjoy table fellowship with. It's not going to be the last time we hear that. We're, we're going to work on that throughout all of the Sundays during Lent. thought I'd just give you a teaser there. Because Lent can be a time of renewal. It can be a time of recommitment. It can be a time of remembering our dependence on Jesus completely to rescue us, which is why we begin Lent by coming to the Lord's Supper table next Sunday morning. It's a time to reinvest in our discipleship, in our efforts to follow Jesus. And so it's my hope and prayer that as we go through these series of sermons, as we work our way through the gospel according to Luke, that we can grow in our faith. And if you have been reading through the gospel of Luke, and I know many of you have been, you might recall from Luke chapter 9, we read it together on January 31st, how, Jesus, how Luke described Jesus as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So the rest of the whole gospel is telling the story of how Jesus, with his eyes fixed firmly on Jerusalem, is moving towards his death, moving towards his crucifixion, moving towards his resurrection and ascension to glory. And this is what it's talking about, right? Taking up to heaven is at the end, when everything's finished, how Jesus was lifted up to the throne room of heaven. Starting at Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we see how Jesus squares his shoulders and determinedly starts on that trip that will have him confronting sin and death and hell. In our passage today, that call to be resolute extends beyond just Jesus to his circle of disciples and to all those others crowd. There were so many that were trampling on each other to also be resolute, to square our shoulders for the journey that's ahead. And it sounds a little bit different than you would think it does, doesn't it? Because as that crowd surrounds and, and the inner circle is there, there's a temptation for the 12 especially and, and others who've been there since the beginning to kind of act as if, well, that's our rabbi and we've been following him and, and we kind of get this stuff. We've, we've got our stuff all together. The, the disciples are only near perfection because they're standing so close to Jesus. They in themselves haven't reached perfection yet. They're still learning, still growing. That is what it is to be a disciple for them as well as for us. And so Jesus calls his disciples to be different than the Pharisees. That's not the model that you ought to follow, Jesus said. Even though whatever else you can say about Pharisees, they work really, really, really hard to try and impress God by their goodness, by their charity, and by their refusal to break any, even of the smallest, of God's laws. And yet, like a lot of high achievers, the Pharisees kind of got proud about their efforts. They kind of got proud about the way that they were able to keep God's law and to live holy lives. And so it was tempting for them to almost get competitive about this so that they started to exaggerate their success about living up to God's law. They're tempted to, to gloss over their failures and pretend, well, nobody saw that. 
And sometimes they make it seem like they actually live up or exceed the standards that they've set for themselves and have the ability then to look down their noses at everybody else. But that's not the case. Because this side of glory, this side of the fall into sin, nobody can live up to God's law perfectly except Jesus himself. And so Jesus calls the behavior of the Pharisees, pretending they have it all together, he calls that hypocrisy. And he warns his disciples sternly against hypocrisy. And here I I need to confess that I made a mistake. In the daily readings, I I said that the the mask that actors wore in the day was called a, a hypocrite, but that's not actually true. It was the actors themselves who were called hypocrites in ancient Greek. And everybody knew that the actors on the stage wearing their masks were acting. Just like the the young kids, they knew that they weren't really as furious as they were trying to make their faces look. They're just acting. Their true feelings were hidden under that angry face or surprised face. But Jesus is confronting that desire in us to act like actors, to hide our brokenness, our sinfulness, to hide our true character behind a mask of goodness, generosity. It's called hypocrisy. And we see hypocrisy all around us. We see it in some religious folks in some politicians, in all kinds of leaders. And it's always a temptation for us as well, me too, to try and pretend that we're better than we are so that people get impressed by us. But that's hard to sustain. And when people get to know you better, they, they realize what you're about. And around our culture right now, there's a lot of people pulling the curtain back making politicians and other people frightened by the Me Too movement that says, well, this is the way people act behind closed doors or in closed offices or on elevators. The hypocrisy is going to be exposed just as Jesus promised it was going to be. Jesus is pretty clear that he's against hypocrisy. He, he calls, speaks about it as if it was yeast. And, and that might not make a lot of sense to us, to, to, for Jesus to warn us as disciples against the, the yeast of the Pharisees. Does, does that make sense to you? Well, we need to unpack that. Because in the Old Testament, when you made an offering of bread or of grain or any of that kind of stuff to the Lord, you were not allowed to include yeast in it, because yeast was considered a contamination. And so the law says really clearly, Leviticus 2, 11, every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast. You are not to burn any yeast or honey in a food offering presented to the Lord. Because yeast was considered to be a contaminant, something that that made that offering that otherwise was good to be dirty. And in the same way, Jesus warns that hypocrisy contaminates any service that you offer to God. Because already it doesn't match up. And if you pretend it does match up to God's standard, uh, you're just fooling yourself and trying to fool others. Any insincerity, any exaggeration of goodness contaminates our efforts to love God. It contaminates our efforts to love our neighbor. But you could pursue this further if you really wanted to. How about to exaggerate your efforts to impress God and others with how you avoid hypocrisy? Wait, this holiness stuff is, is, is more complicated than you think, isn't it? And yet we try. Especially as religious people, we try to make it seem like we got all our stuff together. We're tempted to look down our noses at other people who don't look quite the way that we do. My parents recall the days when TVs first became available. And off of some pulpits they were spoken against as something dangerous, something you shouldn't have. And so those that did dare, the first people who dared to get their TVs 
would have them in a back corner room and would put the antenna up in the attic so that nobody could see it. And when certain visitors come, they would put a tablecloth over it. You couldn't see it, right? I'm told in some corners this stuff still happens. And not just about TVs. I mean, have you ever had it that you were really impressed in your boss or your mom or your teacher with how hard you were working on the computer? But really, you were surfing online or playing a game? And when they came to look over your shoulder, suddenly you had to change windows or, oh, I'm done now! You try and make it sound like you're doing better than you really were. It's acting. It's hypocrisy. You can stop poking each other now. I mean, that's why I had a friend who told me one time, very seriously, he didn't want to put a ixus, a, a fish symbol, on the back of his car. Because he said, you know what, Harold, if I were to do that, I've got to change the way I drive. Oh, boy. Right? We, we get confronted all the time with the, with the extent to which we fail to be perfectly holy. And yet we're really, really concerned with how other people view us. We fear that disapproval from our parents, from our teachers, from our friends. Powerful forces in our life. That disapproval, it makes us scared to be different, to be vulnerable, to be honest. And so scared that we sometimes try to earn their respect by being dishonest. Sounds twisted, doesn't it? But that's exactly the problem that our world faces. That, that everything that God created good has been twisted, has been turned, has been mangled, has been set off kilter, has been thrown upside down. It's not the way it ought to be. Humankind was created with goodness that lived completely up to God's law, to, to love Him with everything we've got, to love our neighbor as ourselves. But that's been twisted and turned. All our values, all of our efforts don't match up anymore. And the uncomfortable truth that the mask is going to be taken off, that our true character is going to be revealed, is kind of frightening for us. And it happens when people get to know us for long enough. They see who we truly are, but, but sometimes we can fool people a little bit longer. We're tempted to try. But we can't keep fooling God. He sees what's done in secret. We sang a really scary song when I was in Sunday school. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. And eyes, and ears, and tongue. And yet, the scariness of God looking down from on high is that He's still looking down in love. And that's the hope, that's the confidence that we have. That surveillance could be frightening, except that God does it in love. But it still reveals that nothing can be secret. Jesus says that too, right? Nothing is concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you've said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you've whispered in the ear in the inner room will be proclaimed from the roofs. Frightening question. Can your life sustain that kind of scrutiny? Can you live up under that kind of close examination? Well, no, right? Ever since humankind fell into sin, we all, I, have fallen short of God's call to goodness and love all the time. Sometimes we get somewhere down the but there's always still something that taints our best efforts. And so without help, we're doomed to die for our sin, to die far from God, to die far from grace. Because in His holiness and His justice, God's not going to ignore human sin. He's got to deal with it. And Jesus has that warning in this passage as well, doesn't He? Jesus says, I'll show you who you need to fear. Not your parents, not, not your uh, uh, governors, not your friends who might somehow disown you otherwise. No, this is who you should fear. 
fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, you can fear him. It sounds odd, though, doesn't it? It sounds odd to be told to be afraid of God when usually we're told to love God. But this is an awe of God's holiness and his justice and his majesty, a recognition that he is altogether good. And we aren't. That God is going to hold people accountable. There will be a day of reckoning. Judgment day is coming. And we need to have proper awe for God's judgment, his authority to damn us to hell. I mean, that's inappropriate to have fear, holy fear, awe, wonder at that kind of authority. And yet if that holy fear wasn't balanced with our experience of God's grace, it would absolutely paralyze us. If it wasn't balanced with our recognition that God is also loving and merciful, uh, then we'd be in deep, deep trouble. But God is also loving and merciful. In grace, Jesus came down from glory to rescue us. God the Father sent God the Son to become human like you and me and everybody else, except that he was without sin. In his teaching, in his actions, Jesus showed us what love looks like, what goodness looks like. And yet he was more than just an example, more than just a miracle worker. Jesus suffered for sin, for human sin throughout his life. But especially in his death at the cross, Because it was there that God the Father put all the punishment for our sin and our guilt and our hypocrisy and put it on Jesus Christ so that he died the death that we deserve, suffered what we deserve to suffer. But he didn't stay dead. He conquered sin, he conquered death, our worst enemies, and became alive so that we also can be confident in God's forgiveness and the life that we have in Jesus through Jesus and with Jesus. Now we're called to serve him by bearing witness, by by telling people what we've seen and heard and experienced of God's grace, his goodness, and his mercy. And here too, God lovingly watches us. We're not supposed to put on masks of holiness or a facade of goodness a false front. No, we need to be honest about our dependence on God. That, that, that but for the grace of God, I, I'd be the same place as everybody else. That's our best response. To be honest about who we are and what God has done for us. Because all of our hope is completely not on us, not what our hands have done, but fully and completely on Jesus Christ. And Jesus has promised that he'd honor even our imperfect efforts. He says, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, who bears witness that that we depend completely on Jesus, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the other side is there as well. Whoever dishonors me before others will be disowned. Sorry, whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And to be acknowledged as a child of God before the angels in that judgment room is the most wonderful thing because that enters us into the new creation where God is on his throne when all things are set right, when the whole of creation is renewed so that it works the way it was intended to work at the very beginning with love and mercy and truth. There's a sternness in this passage that we don't always think of when we think of Jesus and his goodness and his love and his kindness. Jesus is kind of like a coach who's sitting his team down and saying, okay, now it's going to get tough. I need you to dig deep, not just in your own gut, in your own heart, but dig deep in what I've provided for you. You're called to square your shoulders to put in 100% effort Because God has called you and equipped you and trained you to be his disciple. That's the kind of encouragement that we need for this walk of faith. Because it's not all easy. 
is not necessarily we need to air all our dirty laundry. That gets awkward for everybody. But it is a call, a call to be honest about our success in pursuing holiness. That the only reason I'm able to do good is because God, the Holy Spirit, has molded me, shaped me in conformity to God's Word so that I can love my neighbor. Not perfectly yet, but I'm working on it. I can love God. Not perfectly yet, but I'm working on it. Because if we pretend that we're better than we are, then we misrepresent the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ says you can't do it on your own. We need a Savior. And so if we try to pretend that we are good enough on our own, we're misrepresenting the gospel, and we might lead other people astray. It might discourage someone who's a little bit more honest and realizes that they're not up to snuff, that they need help. Because we have the good news that help is offered completely, freely, through Jesus Christ, who has made us, in God's sight, holy and just. He's clothed us in his own righteousness so that we have hope for our future. That we have faith, hope, and love that's going to get strengthened. As we eat and drink and confess, we can't do it on our own, but need a Savior, namely Jesus Christ. Amen.